Uh, thank you very much for those, those kind words. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be part of this conference. Uh, I learned a lot yesterday. I enjoyed Tim Geithner's discussion a lot. Uh, so I, I actually, unlike the people two sessions from now, didn't get any firsthand knowledge of, of, the, of the financial crisis, but managed to talk to a lot of people. And the, I'm going to start, I'm going to have basically one point that's going to be about liquidity, uh, whether there's such a thing as too much liquidity. But I'm going to start with a very standard, uh, at least in this room, based on what I heard yesterday, uh, the, a very standard narrative uh, on the crisis and a somewhat standard one on the responses that, uh, to the crisis. So, I mean, what so there was a housing shock, right? Housing prices went down more than uh, some people expected. Uh, and presumably, you can compare that in the value to like the stock market drop uh, you know, in 2000 or something like that. So it was a similar size shock, but we got a crisis. So obviously it had something to do with the financial system and the architecture of the financial system. Uh, and a lot of uh, regulation and law across the world sort of came in to try to say, let's try to reduce some of the vulnerabilities so we don't get uh, a crisis just like the last one. And there were many narratives, we heard several of them yesterday, there were many narratives on uh, what it was about the architecture of the system that, that caused uh, the, the vulnerability to the crisis. So one big one, the one that I'm um, going to focus on today, is runs and uh, runs due to things that look like short-term debt. Collateral calls uh, at AIG, that looks a lot like short-term debt because you have to come up with money in a hurry. Uh, there's also this interconnectedness thing. Uh, too interconnected or too partially interconnected, if you think about Franklin's stuff. Uh, and turns out that actually gets and ends up being about liquidity in many cases. Uh, the other sort of extreme is sort of anticipated bailouts. That's we have crises because people anticipate if there's a crisis, they'll get bailed out. And if we could just commit never to, to have a, a, a bailout, we'd never have any crises. That one I have a hard time taking seriously. but. One of my former colleagues takes that one seriously. Uh, so there's also this thing about regulation, that there was the unregulated shadow banking sector, that a lot of the, 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 the maturity and liquidity mismatch was there. That was clearly important. Uh, there was also clearly very low levels of capital uh, in the, the broker dealers and in a number of the commercial banks. Okay, so the regulations didn't really you know, you know, if you look at them, you're going to say, well, which, which idea did they have in mind when they wrote Dodd-Frank? And it was like, well, they sort of imagined there could be any of these. Let's try to fix them all, or let's do some things that deal with all of these uh, in, in, and, in and of themselves. So every talk I've given in the last 10 or 15 years that, that isn't a paper and was about crises has this slide in it. The word private got introduced uh, after, after the euro crisis. Uh, private financial crises are everywhere and always uh, due to the problems of short-term debt. So that says it's about short-term debt, the need to raise funding quite rapidly, and the notion that there can be uh, panic, self-fulfilling prophecy problems if people think for whatever reason, but particularly potential insolvency, if they think for whatever reason uh, a firm that holds or a bank that holds a bunch of assets that aren't perfectly liquid is going to have a hard time refinancing its debt. So if you have short-term debt, most of your debt has to be refinanced. So this, this, is, this is sort of what a crisis is. So going back to what I was about before, a lot of these things are either ways of implementing this, this fragility through short-term debt backing illiquid stuff, or some of these other things uh, are about potential vulnerabilities potential losses that might get you into the range where the bank is so, or the firm is so poorly capitalized that people are sort of on a hair trigger to have a, a fear of a run. So uh, I'm going to say that, that a lot of the things that were done were about addressing vulnerabilities, but if we're actually, you could imagine you had vulnerabilities with lots and lots of long-term finance, and you could then have drops in consumption and things like that. Uh, similar to what you can get in a financial crisis. But if you're actually thinking about the crisis, if you read all, essentially all the books I read by people who were dealing with this day to day, when the crisis actually became a crisis, 
it was the runs, the panics, the liquidity that people started to focus on. And then they needed to get that in place so they could think about some longer things, like longer term things, including recapitalization, which had to be dealt with in the very, very short term as well, because uh, solvency, even without the illiquidity problems, was, was there. Okay, so that's pretty standard. So then I could ask, and I'm going to give a very different than the normal answer to this one, like how do we think about evaluating the, the regulations? That would be nice, I can say, he, he, based on 10 years experience, how well do these regulations do? Uh, so one thing we can say is we didn't have a crisis in the last, you know, after the last one. Uh, you know, we had continuing things going on in Europe, but I'm going to say pro sovereign crises, you know, the, the governments can do things that, 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 that the private sector can't. Uh, and they can have crises of their own. So we could say, well, we didn't have a crisis, therefore, one of two things. Either the regulations worked, or we didn't need any stinking regulations because crises, that, that, that was so 10 years ago. Uh, the point I'm going to make is a bit different from that. I'm going to say that in addition to the long-term things that are supposed to address vulnerabilities to crisis, uh, the thing you do in the short term and the thing that persists today is lots, there's lots and lots of liquidity in the, corp, in the corporate system and in the financial system. So liquidity doesn't just mean cash, it doesn't just mean lines of credit, borrowing ability, it doesn't just mean Fed programs, it means if, if we think of like, you know, Nobu Kiyotaki stuff, we think it's like there's high net worth, high financial capacity in the corporate sector uh, today, and uh, some of that liquidity has been due to policy, things like QE. Uh, but the point I'm going to make, and I'm going to make it in two different ways, is that this liquidity, the lots of liquidity, essentially provides a tailwind for the financial sector, sort of like a shock absorber for the financial sector. So we put in these long-term things that potentially could be good, potentially could be bad, that address vulnerability. But at the same time, we injected, and this corporate sector chose to keep lots and lots of liquidity, and lots and lots of liquidity leads to the opposite of fire sale prices for real and financial assets, but I'm going to focus on real assets. So real assets, when they're selling and they're anticipated to keep selling at their long-term fundamental value, there's no, there's no fire sale pricing today or none's anticipated tomorrow, uh, that provides lots of potential extra borrowing capacity to, to firms and to financial intermediaries. Uh, it does more than that, it turns out. So that one reason that looks, that, that even if the, we put the absolute wrong, unless we went too far, in the absolute wrong set of, vulner, set of vulnerability regulations, the fact that we have lots and lots of liquidity floating around in the system today could be and probably is the one main reason that things look uh, you know, that things look stable today and that we haven't had another crisis. So liquidity is sort of a, a important short-term way of, of fighting crises. There's a problem of too little liquidity, there's a problem of too much liquidity I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and in, if we're in the period where there's lots and lots of liquidity, that short-term thing will prevent or at least reduce the, the, the vulnerability in the short run to a crisis. So you can't measure the, 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 the long-term stuff very well. Okay, so let me just talk about, that, that, and so the liquidity, this thing about liquidity providing a tailwind, that's gonna be the theme. Uh, so let me just say two things. Uh, so there are some good regulations, and what we can say is essentially, the new re there are regulations that did something. They actually changed behavior. That's pretty much what we can conclude. And then we pretty much had some ideas from looking what happened in the crisis or just thinking about how crises work on like what's a good regulation, what's a bad regulation. They did, crises regulation did some things. That they were not just irrelevant. People complain, so that means that also means they did something because if they're gonna make you, not, if, the crisis, if the regulation prevents you from doing something you want to do, you will complain. So here's one thing, here's a good regulation. This is purely about runs. And it was an interesting thing that I think the way it worked was sort of an unintended, or unless it was very subtle, because I was talking to people when, they, when these things were coming in, there was an unintended consequence of the way the regulation worked. Okay, so there was one run-prone thing which was a great shock to people, 
was runs on institutional money market funds. Uh, so in the in fact, when Phil Divig and I were giving uh, the, the early versions of the Diamond Divig paper, we sort of said, we yeah, had the run-free thing, it's sort of like a money market fund because they have liquid assets and liquid liabilities. Okay. Well, the point is, is like liquid assets, one day safe liquid assets, that would be essentially no mismatch, but there was enough mismatch here, uh, and as we know, well, we, as I didn't know at the time, but as we learned, there hardly is a very active secondary market for commercial paper, so even money market funds, if you have people who can think about fear of fear itself, which is what the institutions are good at, or maybe one thing they're good at, uh, we can see that there was essentially a run on, right around Lehman, you see this big drop in outstanding institutional prime, people hold commercial paper, money market funds, and there was another one that was almost as fast uh, uh, during the Eurozone crisis. And if you look at the retail stuff, which is stuff the bottom line in the red, that looked relatively smooth because this idea of thinking strategically about getting out before the other guys get out, that wasn't something that was on the radar screen of the, of the households. And then empirical work probably suggests, suggests, this is probably about the difference between institutional holders and retail holders, because you could see this on money market funds from the same originator that had the same portfolio, so it wasn't differences in the portfolio, it was differences in the holders. So what do we do? What, what, what was the, there, there were lots of ideas. That, so like think of money market funds as like repos with no haircut, but on a diversified portfolio. So, that, so some people said, well, let's put a haircut in there. It's like a 2% capital requirement or something. Instead, that people in the, in the in that, that would have been very hard to implement it turned out. So instead what they did was say, okay, if you're an institutional money market fund, you have to have a floating net asset value unless you're a government one, and you, pretend, you have to put suspension of convertibility in, uh, gates, that if, if people are pulling money out so fast that you're running out of, of cash, then, uh, then you have to l let people, force people to stay in for a while. So what that did is essentially kill the institutional prime money market fund. So you see they're you know, sitting around a trillion and they go to around 200 a billion in, in, in assets, that's the, the, the red, and then you can see this offsetting thing, the blue, the increase in the uh, government institutional assets. So the corporate treasurers basically said, gee, if this thing can have a floating net asset value, we're only allowed to hold safe stuff. So now we can't hold it anymore. So it's the same assets. So if you just do it, change the way you do the accounting for it, it's gonna change. So that basically says these were what, what uh, like Andre, and Rob, Andre Schleifer and Rob Vishney call fake safe assets. Uh, and this was, or maybe to get around regulation or something like that. So this essentially, to make these guys, they made these guys stable by killing them, essentially, and that, that's, that will usually stop fluctuations. Uh, and it works this, well, never mind. Uh, you can think of other things where that's true. Okay, and then you can see the, the, the stuff on the bottom, the, the green line and the purple line, something similar went on for the retail money market funds but nothing is extreme, and you can sort of see, just looking at the red line, the red line was the institutional uh, prime funds, and that falls in, out, in total value below the, 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 the uh, retail ones, and so it started way above, went ba way below, you can see there's a bigger thing going on. Okay, so that that that's a regulation, it changed behavior. Okay. okay, so is that good, is that bad? We don't know. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch back to liquidity, and we do have a lot of evidence that liquidity was a problem during the crisis. And if you look at what actually happened fast, lots of, in the Federal Reserve, uh, very quickly, and then later the ECB, introduced lots and lots of very, very creative liquidity interventions. So what this chart shows, that you can see on the screen, is the secondary market price of leveraged loans. So these are syndicated loans, uh, you know, high yield syndicated loans. And you can basically, and the, the default rate on these didn't change very much, it turned out, in the crisis. So let's imagine everybody believed that ex ante, which is uh, obviously too, too far. So the, the bid price of these things goes from somewhere in the 90 to 95 range down to 65 by the, by the uh, a month and a half after Lehman. So think about that as fire sale pricing. So that says there's limited liquidity in this market. People could, work, well, if, unless you think people thought the world was coming to the end, there's some other evidence that suggests that that was actually not the world coming to the end. It was probably something about liquidity, at least in part. So the, the illiquidity is the thing that makes uh, runs occur. 
So it, if you think about for a single bank, it's the reason you care about other people getting out in a hurry. If you think about a network of banks, it's the, it's the fire sale that other people are losing funding, so they're selling assets, pushing them down. One is sort of like, one's like uh, within an institution, one's across institutions. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. So clearly there was way too little liquidity in the crisis. It's not like the, the, the that we didn't inject enough liquidity ex ante, the fact that there was a shortage of liquidity was, was what made the crisis a crisis. Why things happen so fast, that's what runs are about. So, and the point I'm gonna make today is one, the one I already made, that there's a lot of liquidity today, that works like a shock absorber and makes regulations look either unneeded or successful. But Raghu Rajan, uh, Yunza Hu and I have a theory we actually have two of them right now. We have one on intermediary leverage that we just finished uh, that basically says too much liquidity can be something that removes the uh, incentives for firms to maintain their future debt capacity. Call that financial care, being careful. They're going to be financially careless if, there, if there's lots and lots of liquidity. And basically the idea is if asset prices are selling at their full value, there's no underpricing expected or it's unlikely that tomorrow they'll be underpricing, actions you take voluntarily today to improve your and others' ability to borrow against an asset can't increase the value of the asset above its full fundamental value. But they can increase the value of the asset above its fire sale price because it allows people buying it dur during the fire sale to finance a bigger fraction of their bid and bid a higher amount. So essentially too much liquidity in a boom, this means net worth within the firms. It may have something to do with, with monetary policy and things like that, but given that, that Ben was, was, was talking to Raghu about that last night, I'm not gonna get into that part, uh, not having ever been a, a central banker. So too much net worth, too much liquidity in a boom, high asset prices, I'll show you a picture of this later, removes this incentive to take these things. Put covenants into loans, uh, improve voluntary accounting standards, to choose monitored or screened lending versus market lending. And we also have a new paper that basically says this leads to in equilibrium less needed skin in the game for securitizations. So securitizations can end up being almost like they sell off the equity piece as well, essentially because there's not screening or monitoring needed during these times. So it's not the way it works, but given that Tim Geithner was here yesterday, I thought of an interesting like analogy. So he has this foam on the runway analogy of, 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 of metaphor of thinking about what, what uh, you do to fight a financial crisis. So it's not the way it works, but the idea is if there's a lot of foam in the runway, no profit maximizing airline would put any maintenance into their landing gear because you can land just fine without them. And then during this period where there's foam on the runway and lots and lots of it, you will see plenty of safe landings for firms who didn't put their banks, banks firms, planes who didn't put down their landing gear. So that's essentially our, so if you want to give incentives for people to be careful, you've got to make them, they have to be, and careful means putting covenants and increasing your future borrowing capacity. It has to be the case that if you don't do that, the, your assets don't sell at a very high price, you can't borrow as much in the future, and uh, if, you, uh, if, if, you, if you can't refinance, uh, things, inefficient things will happen, okay? So we just take this as an outcome of our model, as it turns out that Janet Yellen and other central bankers around the world have been a little bit on the same page. We came from this from, from, from theory rather than really understanding what's going on. Uh, so basically this model says that in these high liquidity periods where assets are not selling at anything close to fire sale values, there's gonna be a boom in covenant light lending. And we'll see that there has been, I'll show you a picture uh, of it in a minute. And if you think about this as corporate governance does, is sort of a waste in the same, improved corporate governance and improved accounting auditing is a waste in the same way that uh, landing gear maintenance would be. Uh, if there was lots of foam on the runway. Uh, we see there was a recent uptick in U.S. audits, which from the uh, uh, U.S. regulations where, regulated, where auditors report major weaknesses in internal control in earnings restatements. So here's the covenant light. This Raghu showed a similar picture last night. 
But essentially, if you look at the, the blue, is the, the dollar, billion dollar values of covenant light loans coming out in, in the US. So leverage loans, syndicated loans are high yield. Covenant light means that there, there's not a, a, cov a control covenant like a net worth covenant that trips something and turns the thing if it's uncollateralized and collateralized or gives the lender the right to accelerate payment to today. So there was, a, there was like essentially none of this before 2004. There was a little blip of it up in 2006 to 2007, sort of went away for a while, and it came back in spades, and, and it's very, very large today. Uh, so that, uh, that's the blue, and then the, the gold line is the fraction, the percentage of covenant light leverage loans. Uh, it's around 50% in, at the end of this period. It's actually gone up a bit since. Th this is through the uh, third quarter of 2017 when we, when we put this data together. Okay, so I also mentioned this thing on weakness of internal control. This is the percentage of firms that were reported with weak internal control and earnings restatements the year or two subsequent years after that. So we saw a big increase of this right in the, in the run-up before the crisis. It went down to almost nothing right after the crisis, and it's sort of gone, gone back up. That's, again, a little more suggestive. The, other, the, the covenant light thing is a direct measure of what we're talking about. The weakness of inner internal control is sort of a consequence of, of previous periods of, of financial carelessness. So then Raghu talked about this one last night, that, that basically what the point of this is that if you correlate these things like covenant light, things that look like uh, not lots and lots of uh, financial care being taken, not lots of monitoring and screening going on, it does correlate quite highly with these measures of, uh, of financial looseness within countries. Uh, Great. So again, with moderate amounts of liquidity in the system, the market encourages covenants. Market forces naturally limit leverage, encourage, encourage covenants, et cetera. We're doing some empirical work on the pricing of covenants and things like that. There's some evidence that, that suggests this is true. With a huge amounts of liquidity in the system, market forces don't naturally encourage covenants and low leverage. The cross-section pricing of more covenants is fairly flat, so that if you don't like them, you don't get them. Only if we get if we get a negative shock after the uh, period of high liquidity, we'll find that the firms didn't maintain their financial capacity, they didn't put covenants in their loans, they didn't improve their corporate governance, and uh, bad things will happen. And this is, explains Warren Buffett's quote in our mind, only when the tide goes out do you discover uh, who's been swimming naked. And so our idea is that swimsuits are endogenous, and people would really like it if other people wore swimsuits. But in periods where the tide, the liquidity is very high, they're basically a waste of resources because it, there's no, when, it, it, there's too much transparency after the, after the tide goes out. <laughs> okay, so that's, that, that's, our, that's our basic idea. Uh, and I had a little picture of how this works, but I don't have time to show you the picture. Basically, liquidity goes up, fire sale pricing goes away. If it's gonna stay away with a high enough probability, Leverage goes up in a way that removes your incentive to improve pledgeability. Uh, look, at our, look at the paper, the original paper is on my website, and the second paper will be on my website as soon as I get back to Chicago. Thank you very much. So, Doug is happy to take some questions. Yeah. Yes. Is this another way to... Uh, There's a microphone. I'm Ben Golub. Uh, the, uh, isn't another way to think about it that simply during a time when there's a lot of liquidity, there are basically more cash chasing fewer assets, and people just cut corners because they got to put money to work? Um, I mean, that's sort of an alternative. So essentially, that's going to say sort of the quality of firms that get financed is going to go way down. So let's, so if, if you imagine there was like, uh, it's almost, lots of liquidity going around basically means that the discount rate that people use to discount future cash flows changes. So in, if there's too much liquidity, you start going more and more down the margin of bad firms. So we're making, so that could be true. In fact, there's also this, this, this uh, schleifer vishni thing about excessive optimism during these times. That could be true as well. We have a, a, a point which is, separate from those and works in addition to those, that in some sense the actual contracting, governance, uh, 
covenant monitoring and things like that, those things, uh, market forces don't naturally encourage those things uh, during such periods. Uh, so we actually, the amount of, in our models, the amount of liquidity that the, the buyers have is never a constraint. This is purely uh, liquidity in the hands of sort of firm, like Rob Vishny and Andre Schleifer's stuff, of in the hands of people, firms who could acquire the specific real assets of firms. When those guys have a lot of net worth, we get our effect. Lots of money floating around among financial intermediaries or private equity firms and things like that. We, we don't have that effect. I think in practice they're both important, but our thing through governance uh, is not an implication, I think, of, of, of what you just said. <laughs> Wilson? Question uh, about, um, there's a lot of enforced liquidity now in the financial system. So LCR, NSFR yeah. put trillions of enforced liquidity on banks' balance sheets. Does that mean banks have more liquidity, or does that mean their actual buffers of real liquidity, the distance to a regulatory constraint is now lower and there's less liquidity? How do you view that conundrum? Okay, so uh, first thing, the, the liquidity in our model is sort of sitting on corporate balance sheets and then we have this separate thing that determines how much um, leverage and liquidity the financial intermediaries have. So th that's, that's just in terms of relating it directly. Uh, so let me put on a different hat. Like Anil Kashyap and I have thought about the point of requiring some liquidity that can't be used. So the point that we thought, thought the, the only way you can understand that is that it's not like a fixed amount of liquidity, but it's a fixed proportion of liquidity as a function of your liabilities. So the idea is that since there's some you can't use, liquidity requirements like the, the leverage, you know, the, the LCR or the net stable funding ratio, encourage banks to hold liquidity in excess of that's re required so that they hold the buffer over the minimum, which increases the amount of liquidity held in the entire system and then we had the sort of the idea that if the system as a whole holds the liquidity, holds this extra liquidity, then the lender of last resort at the first little bit is lending against liquidity, required liquidity in these firms. So it actually could improve the stability of the whole financial system. If you think aggregate liquidity matters as much as individual bank liquidity, if you think about system, systemic liquidity, liquidity requirements, as long as it's not a number, as long as the proportion actually makes perfect sense. <coughs> Doug? Yeah. <coughs> Bob Posen from uh, MIT. So is there any evidence that uh, having a fluctuating NAV on institutional money funds actually reduces the chance of a liquidity problem or financial crisis? As I'm sure you know, in Europe, yeah. they've had, they yeah. had uh, fluctuating yeah. NAV before 2008, and people still fled. So I, I completely, completely agree. I, I was part of this thing called the Squam Lake Group, and we had a, a recommendation that essentially required capital, requi if you wanted to have a non-floating NAV, you could only do that if you had at least 2% capital left, and it had to float after that, and then you essentially couldn't take any new money in. So basically, if you think about commercial paper, there's not an active secondary market for commercial paper. So if, you, if there's no market to mark to, marking to market is a fairly stupid concept. So, so th that's why I said the, the thing that worked on the money market funds was the fact that they had to mark to market meant that the corporate treasurers couldn't treat them as safe. And marking to market wouldn't work, but killing them did work. So, that, 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 so that's, that's my take on this. Okay, Thank well, you. Let me thank uh, Doug for his uh, keynote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.